There you are, Jason. Good morning. Hey, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our session today. Uh, with me today, uh, we have Michael Hart, who's a senior manager in our uh, consulting side of our cloud and data center transformation. I'm Jason Rader, and today we're going to be talking about business continuity and resiliency. Uh, Michael, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. All right. So as we kind of talked about a little bit in the pre uh, room, B business continuity, resiliency, disaster recovery, backup, those words kind of get intermingled every now and then. Can you kind of set the record straight and kind of give us a definition of those terms? Sure. Uh, business continuity, disaster recovery, they're more legacy terms. Resiliency is the last decade or so. It's really the nirvana that you want to be shooting for. Um, that's your bulletproof infrastructure, like the old telcos back in the day where they would have distributed redundancy across you know, a large geography um, with uh, load balancing up front. So no matter what happens to your infrastructure, everything just keeps running. That's the true nirvana of resiliency. Uh, business continuity is focused on the business. That's about keeping your business running no matter what happens. Um, the key there is understanding what the impacts are to losing different parts of your business. Um, disaster recovery is the automated systems part of that. And if you, and if I get confusing, let me know. Is the automated systems great. part of that business continuity, right? So no, almost no business today runs without some sort of computers and, and software running behind it. Um, that is becoming the business in a lot of cases. So disaster recovery is coming to the front burner. Um, in some cases, if you're down for minutes, your customers switch to a completely different service and they may or may not come back. So, um, you know, being being fully resilient is uh, is very important in the modern day. And then so backup, the in the old days, people would just, you know, hey, I got it backed up, I'm all done. So that's why we brought backup in there. And yeah, and so they're not one of the same by any means. I think uh, disaster recovery and backup, some people think that those are the same thing uh, and obviously they're not. Yeah, backup doesn't cover everything you need in, in uh, disaster recovery and definitely not in business continuity. Okay. And so, you know, you talked about resiliency kind of making a resurgence as far as the word that we use for this. Are, are people coming to you now talking about uh, these topics? Is that is that's kind of a hot topic these days? I would assume specifically related to the current conditions that we're working under. Yeah, current events have definitely made disaster recovery and business continuity more relevant um, in the forefront of uh, the, you know, the manager's minds and, and people in general. Um, folks have had a chance to, uh, to test out their crisis management plans and, and their uh, you know, activation plans for their business continuity. This hasn't been truly a disaster for a lot of folks because disaster focuses on the IT and the IT is still humming. It's just, you can't go to the office and congregate or maybe somebody can't go to the data center and keep things, keep the lights on. Yeah, and a lot of their contingency plans of maybe going to a different data center or operations center, uh, those are kind of out the window, right? Yeah, so if I'm doing my business continuity plan, I'm gonna identify 100 people in my organization that are have critical functions I'm going to find another place for them to work, or maybe I'll arrange for them to work at home. But I never plan for 5,000 people to go home and work. So it's completely swamped whatever plans they had from a connectivity perspective. And people have been very creative and responsive in coming up with new ways to connect all those at-home workers. Um, and, and we've had a lot of discussions about that. Also, uh, we've, we've helped some folks with the crisis. You know, how do, how do I do you have any samples for crisis management plans and that kind of thing? Because it's a little different than regular Agreed. ER. And, and so that brings up an interesting point because, you know, it sounds like what you're talking about, we typically, at least in, in generations past, we would have kind of a pushed a lot of this responsibility into the IT organization. It's more than that, right? Yeah. The IT guys are, like you said, people have expectations that the IT systems are just going to keep running. On the on the flip side, they don't really like to spend a lot of money to, to help those guys prepare for this. Uh, so it's important to understand what the critical parts of your business are, where they rely on IT or or just what the impacts are to the business if certain functions don't function. 
Um, and that's achieved through a business impact analysis. It's a, a pretty standard formal process that you go through and you have to do it fairly regularly in order to, as you know, as your business changes, in order to understand where to spend the money so you can efficiently spend money on disaster recovery, on planning, on running exercises in order to keep yourself um, able to respond to events as they occur. Okay, so you brought up an interesting term. So business impact analysis or BIA, as we often talk about it, you know, when I take my security exams and those kinds of things, I see that term, I know what it is. It seems like uh, pretty important to the whole resiliency process. Can you kind of walk us through what a BIA would be in an organization? Sure. There's a, there's a couple ways to do it. One is more of an accounting bottoms up focused way, which uh, involves a lot of people coming in and, and looking at your organization in, in great depth and can be very slow to do and, and um, quite costly actually. The other approach is more of a top down where you assume that the people that run the business know what the important parts of the business are and you run a facilitated and supported by IT system, some you know, some soft, uh, really decision support systems that um, that allow you to have a conversation around what's important and make estimates on what the impacts are. I've seen, I've seen BIAs where people estimate that they would lose the entire you know revenue of the company in, in two days when we know that that's not true, right? So you you need to have, you need to be able to bring some uh, common sense logic to that and challenge those uh, conversations as they happen and come out with a realistic estimate of what the impacts are. But really what you're worried about is focusing in on the most critical functions that the business performs and what the impact is on the business and their community and their reputation and their ability to stay in business if they don't perform those. It's uh, we, we can do it in a, in a month or two um, for most organizations at a pretty reasonable yeah. Gotcha. So timing is probably the next thing you're thinking of, right? Sure. Go into that. So folks um, should be doing these every year. A business impact analysis is um, out of date in about 12 months. Within 18 months, it's almost useless. The, the big rocks of your organization are probably still there, but the small stuff has moved around enough. Um, one of the anecdotes we find when we go through and we do an analysis of people's disaster recovery plans, which is you know the sort of downstream from the BIA, is uh, you check who the contacts are who you would notify in case of a disaster, and we're calling people that haven't worked there in you know three to five years sometimes. So it's important to keep these um, this refreshed and up to date on a, on a regular cycle. What people remember. Um, from the process of going through the BIA is as important as having that document for your planning purposes. Oh, that sounds super important. And now, obviously we've been involved in a lot of these uh, over the years. And I think you, you brought up something interesting, um, you know, as you go through an organization and talk about the different um, primary functions and the, the way that would impact if they weren't available, a lot of folks, you know, you know, if I'm talking to the finance department, they're like, oh, all of our servers are critical and they have to be up, you know, 24-7. Uh, and then you go to, you know, HR and they're going to say exactly the same thing. And at, at the end of the day, we're going to get all of these. Everybody says everything needs to be five nines available. Uh, and that to me, if somebody just passes off on something that way, that can cost a lot more than it needs to cost the organization to, 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 to have a plan in place and to deal with that. Right. Yeah. The classic HR is, hey, I have to pay people, so I have to be up. Say it happens on a Thursday, I have to make a payroll on Friday. I have to have my stuff back up in 12 hours, maybe two hours. Then your high availability in all your HR systems. You know, the classic workaround for that is almost everybody uses an external provider today. Or you simply pay them what you paid them last week because that whole file is someplace else. That's a really yeah. easy fix that, that saves you from having to keep you know, SAP or uh, PeopleSoft or some other system 24 seven available. Um, yeah. And, and, so, that's, and that's part of the, the logic that you drive through when you get this BIA. So if I could infer from what you're saying, if we did the BIA properly and did the planning around it properly for your uh, overall resiliency plan, it's possible that doing this properly 
could take some costs out of the organization. It, it, yeah, it can <laughs> definitely save you on your on your DR planning. So the whole life cycle, right? You, you, the BIA determines the requirements up front. And then you say, OK, well, we've got to have let's use HR, for instance, HR functions need to be performed within a few hours, potentially, of having a, a, an outage. And then you go, well, what's our strategy for that? Well, one strategy is we'll just make all the systems absolutely resilient. So they never go down. Well, that could be kind of costly, right? Whereas another strategy you could take is, hey, we'll just save the file and keep it offsite someplace. So if we need it, we can just get it get it back and you know send it to our offsite providers and they can print the checks and uh, do all the direct deposits. That'll work great. One costs, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars and the other costs like 12 cents a month. So um, that's the strategy phase. And then you have to go into the implementation phase of how you build it out, right? If you've decided that everything's resilient, you might be building data centers or getting contracts off site. And so your costs can really balloon um, depending on the strategy you choose out of that business impact analysis. The business impact analysis itself uh, sets the requirements for when you need things back. Everybody's got to agree on, yeah, we need to be able to pay people within a couple of days. But the way you implement that through the strategy and the implementation phase can have huge impacts on the on your long term costs. Um, you know, we've identified in a strategy that uh, someone can uh, do their licensing different, pays for the entire DR program for the year. That's brilliant. So it sounds like with the way that we're talking that this is way bigger than an IT involved situation, right? It's, it's more than just the IT program that's going to be handling this. Yeah, I think we, uh, we touched on it at first, but one of the biggest uh, issues we find in, in, our, um, in our work is that the, the IT guys and the business folks that run the business continuity part of this, usually compliance or someone in that area, they don't always talk to each other, um, <laughs> right? Agreed. So the, the IT guys are asking for stuff. The compliance guys are like, yeah, that's on our roadmap three years from now. And a three-year-old BIA is like no BIA at all, right? So um, with the ITs, they have expectations folks have uh, laid on them. They have to do something. So they will assume what those requirements are, and they'll go out and they'll take some steps to do that on their own. That, that disconnect is uh, one of the, the things we really encourage people to do is to work together better to, uh, to have their activation plans, their business impact analysis, and their IT response to all of that coordinated. And um, it's much more effective. And you put the, the money in the right places when you do it that way. Yeah, I think that level of coordination is really key to... Uh, success in general. And I think, you know, it's it's interesting because we, we work with a lot of folks who have cloud initiatives going on, right? Uh, and then you've got the, maybe the business continuity, the resiliency initiatives over here. You've got the cloud initiatives over here. You've got the normal IT operations and refreshes going on over here. Uh, obviously, there's there's a way to bring all of this stuff together. Again, cost savings, advancing you know, the capabilities of the organization by utilizing better options in the cloud and other things like that. Do you experience that a bit or? Yeah, is that, that's a, yeah. that's a complicated question. Well, yeah, sorry, let's, let's it was. Go into that. <laughs> yeah, right. Let's go into that topic. Um, philosophically, disaster recovery, uh, your response shouldn't be different than your day-to-day -day operations. Um, it, you shouldn't have a different infrastructure completely to recover your your environments on than you have in production because the switching um, from one to the other can be troublesome when you need it, and you have two you have two different environments to maintain that are sometimes you know drastically different. Um, so philosophically, you should have DR look very much like production, just like you have your QA environment look like production, because hey. Once it's out of QA, it's going to go in production. Well, if it's in production, it's going to go to DR. It's better. It better run at least um, to some extent, right? Some people scale back so they can run at a, at a lower uh, available, uh, not availability, but a lower um, capacity in DR just to save money. 
Now the cloud has has freed up, um, has given us an opportunity to get very low cost infrastructure. So once you have it set up, you can shut it off and pay a maintenance fee. Uh, the different cloud providers have different approaches. Um, it you know it, it varies in their maturity and, and their ability to 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 do this. But in the best case, um, you can set up your infrastructure, shut it down, have full capacity when you need it, uh, and just keep. A, basically a small maintenance environment up there where you're doing your backups um, and your updates to that environment so that when you need it, you flip a switch, it comes up and you operate there. Now to go back to my original point of having DR kind of look like your home environment, there's some systems today you couldn't run in the cloud because they're legacy or their OSs are out of date or, or things like that. So. Um, Going through that process of moving things to the cloud forces you to update a lot of these systems. Um, so a lot of folks that would do this in a cloud today will end up with some sort of a hybrid model where they have some of it in the cloud that can go now and some of it at home. And I think that's fine. Um, that's It still lowers your cost overall. Uh, and maybe your long-term plan should be to move some of those things and migrate them to the cloud. Um, but don't think you can take your entire environment today. If you've, you know, if you've been in, in a legacy data center for 20 years, you've got some things in there that are going to add a little friction when you slide them over to the cloud, and they're not going to operate there completely. Um, wow, I, I went a long ways with that. Did I uh, hit the points that you were talking about? No, I, I think you did. And I, you kind of brought up an interesting thing, because uh, I think that classically, we would think everything in a data center, if we had, you know, from a resiliency perspective, we need to have another data center, same square footage, everything duplicated, and we can do a failover. That's mucho expensive, right? Oh, yeah. I think that doing, you know, and then just looking at a resiliency program for only resiliency stake is probably short-sighted, right? We've got to look at it from, hey, let's look at what's in our data center and what we could potentially move to the cloud before then, and then figure out how we can maintain those those legacy systems that we know oh, that that box that's in there that's like don't touch it we don't know what it does but we know it's important let's just maintain this thing um yeah. and i'll look find those <laughs> yeah, exactly we've both seen those so i think that like you said that that coordination between it's if if you're just talking about the it side of the house or or one or the other sides of the house you get kind of a a short-sighted view of this. And again, you can spend more money or you can have this resiliency that isn't needed, or you can have you know, the same old, same old when you could have gotten resiliency as well as additional capability uh, by moving some of these workloads to the cloud. So in my mind, business continuity and resiliency in general, which used to be kind of this thing that wasn't that interesting to kind of talk about from you know, in a, in a meeting, company meeting, it now seems like when we're talking transformation, this is one of the key aspects that we can look at from a transformative per perspective on how we go to market, right? Yeah. Resiliency being your nirvana, um, it, it was often very costly, like you said, to achieve, right? Uh, uh, remember back in the day, uh, maybe I shouldn't use clients' names, but one company had two data centers in the, in the Salt Lake area, um, oddly, right on the runway to Salt Lake Airport, which we thought was odd, but hey, there were two, so what the heck. They would flip-flop between those two data centers on a regular basis. They would operate out of one for a month, and they would flip-flop to the other and operate out of that one for a month. And then, Which sounds awesome. It's awesome. It was hugely expensive um, and probably more resiliency than they needed for the entire data center. Uh, the right-sizing your, your, uh, your approach to that is, uh, <laughs> saves you a lot of money. So just recovering the systems that need to be recovered in minutes, you know, in that tier and, and tiering is a, the concept, right? Having uh, different groups of, of systems that operate and have everything that they need in a tier and then a lower tier and maybe a tier that you bring up in a week or so if you, if, um, you know, if and when you need those systems uh, is a way to just to really um, mitigate the, the cost impacts of that. But when you talk about resiliency, it used to be expensive really expensive to do resiliency. The closer and closer you get to the cloud, the less expensive that resiliency becomes. Today, modern systems, if you build them from the ground up with resiliency in mind, they can live completely in the cloud, be able to span across multiple data centers and, uh, and take what we used to call a graceful degradation in case there's an outage. 
Right, so an outage in West region hits, maybe you lose a little bit of your capacity on that side, but you, maybe you can just reroute some of those customers to your mid region, which is still up and running. Um, it's a little bit of a different uh, approach you have to take to your database management in that case, but now you have a resilient system that's it's not on your premises and it's it you know it's out there in the cloud and redundant and protected in the cloud. Um, you know this I'm going to feed you something here. This is uh, this is where security comes up, right? You've just moved this the, your entire systems to the cloud is is potentially one of the one of your goals. Some of the things, <laughs> wow, I'm going in all sorts of directions. I love it. Keep going. But what I but what I really want to say here is you have to make sure that you're as secure off prem or maybe even more secure than you were when you were on on your premises. So you have to take whatever your security posture is at home and extend it to the cloud for if you're in a resilient footprint or even in a disaster footprint. Because if you have exposures in disaster, that's <laughs> they're going to get you when you're most vulnerable. They're going to come and kick you when you're down. Um, Absolutely, right. And we we've seen that. I think you know. And I, thanks for the the setup. I mean, in security is made up of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So a lot of the availability part is what we've been talking about, right? That whole resiliency play and those things. Uh, and I think a lot of folks kind of did do kind of a shift to an availability play and current, you know, having to enable remote workers and those kinds of things. But we forget that after that availability has been satisfied, we've got to still deal with the integrity and the confidentiality aspects. Everything's not cool just because it's up and running. Uh, we've got to figure out how to maintain those other levels. Everything that is moved to the cloud or otherwise to, from one data center to the next, even the physical security requirements have to be met. Uh, otherwise we're, we're not doing it right. Yeah. One of the biggest security vulnerabilities that people have is being behind on their maintenance. It's it's exactly the same in disaster recovery. Um, if you're not up to date on your maintenance, you go to use those systems, they don't work. Um, the other thing is you you leave your uh, your access open to people that may have left the company years ago. They still have logins. You may not have changed those passwords. Uh, sometimes they're the only people that have access to some of those systems. You um, you leave yourself exposed, so you know just another reason why you should keep your systems up to date. Your your um, you know do your analysis on a regular basis. Um, build it into your day to day life. It makes it more um, more likely to work and keeps you keeps it fresh in your mind and and actually lowers the overall cost of maintaining everything. Isn't that Central. the hardest thing in the world? I mean, uh, totally. You, I think that right? that that operational aspect of keeping this part of every day, keeping the vigilance that needs to happen, making it a priority. That is probably the hardest thing I see in any organization from a security or a resiliency perspective is just keep your eye on that. And, and that kind of brings up the, the next kind of segue I was going to stick in. You, you set me up perfectly. What about like testing? Uh, what about those kinds of things? Right. It goes back to keep it simple. Keep it as much like production as you possibly can. Make it an automated update for your for your environment. That makes it an, an, an automated recovery sequence if you can. That makes your testing super easy. Um, in the old days when you had a mainframe and you had an offsite recovery thing like, uh, you know, I'll, I'll use ComDisco since they don't exist anymore. Sure. Um, uh, you you would reserve time there. You would go and do your recovery. Your people would take a week off to fly somewhere and do some recovery testing. Um, you can now do uh, set up a recovery pro, uh, you know, an exercise program where people can do it in an afternoon, or you can schedule a two-hour meeting and you can just you know run through a tabletop, hit a button, make sure everything comes up, have some people do some testing, and um, and you can really lower the costs on your testing and because it's less painful, do it more frequently and make sure that the, the systems actually work for you when you need them. Perfect. So, you know, since you brought up ComDisco, we've obviously been doing this for a long time, right? So I think, uh, sorry, no slight. I know you just had a birthday recently. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it seems like there's probably a different level of the organization that is asking for these types of services now. It used to be kind of driven by IT. Who are the folks that are engaging you right now for these types of services? 
well, it's still driven by IT, but it's become a lot more real to them, right? Now they're coming to me and going, hey, we, uh, we kind of desperately need this. Uh, can you help us with this spot feature? But um, there's, an, uh, there's an, uh, a lot of folks assume that everything's fine, right? Until something mm -hmm. breaks. So this has brought, uh, raised the awareness in the sea level, right? In the suites that uh, maybe we weren't as prepared as we should have been. And that um, we need to take another look at this, perhaps in more depth, right? Um, folks thought the DR planning would cover what's happening now. It's not necessarily right. got anything to do with DR, right? It's about crisis response and um, it's tested and gone beyond what you had prepared for from your DR. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, I guess to kind of, you know, it sounds like if if I'm following from the very beginning of this, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff that can have a gigantic impact on the organization when done properly or when not done properly. Um, there's alignment with many other initiatives that are going on in a lot of organizations right now, like cloud and and and, and cost takeout and those types of things. What's what's your advice, you know, to kind of close out what first of all, it doesn't sound like we're ever done, but what's your advice as far as somebody who's got a program in place, it probably needs some tweaking. Where should they start? The right place to start is, is an assessment and uh, just to see what you've got. Almost everybody has some level of disaster recovery. Um, sometimes they have assumptions about what's possible. Um, but to get back again to the, the C-suite folks, um, you know, they have some expectations, some things they've read. They uh, they usually get fed kind of a rosy picture from the IT guys because, you know, they want to look good. So they're not always fully aware. So an outside group coming in and exposing some things that, and we'll, you know, it, it can be done gently, but it needs to be sure. clear. Um, we'll tell you where you're at today and help you focus on the areas that you really need to focus on to move forward. Um, if, yeah, so get a, a qualified, trusted advisor in there and have them take a real hard look at what you're doing today, where, you, where you're spending your money, where you should be maybe spending some more money and focus in on those initiatives that have the highest priority in your organization. And strike while the iron's hot, right? It's uh, people, people are aware right now that maybe they weren't fully prepared and, and it's real. You know, we always say it's not an it's not an if it'll happen; it's a when it'll happen. And uh, right now, it just happened, so people believe, "Wow, it could happen," which in six months they'll forget. Agreed. And I think you know, <laughs> just to kind of tag on to what you said, I mean, now especially with with the way things have changed materially in a lot of organizations, now's a good time to go back and take a look at that BIA, right? Uh, because potentially the normal that you had when you originally determined, uh, you know, the impact of different areas uh, could have changed based on how you're doing business right now. Yeah. The assessment should look at, at your linking into the business continuity plans, how recently your BIA has been updated. Um, when I've done these in the past, one of the things that we ask for is, hey, let's look at your plans, your uh, um how your executives would pull together and decide if you've had a disaster and, um, yeah. and w what your most recent BIA says, because that'll give me a clue into lots of things. Like if it isn't there or you've never done one, that's a big clue that, you know, you may want to do one of those things because everybody else is just running blind and guessing if you have a lot of times they guess pretty accurately, but sometimes they can just completely miss the ball. So uh, it's really good to do the BIA if you haven't had one in a while. Fantastic. We're just beating the hell out of that thing, aren't we? Hey, well, I think it, it just shows how important it is. And I think, you know, Michael, thank you for your expertise. And I think uh, hopefully that the folks who are listening in have been inspired in a certain way, maybe to continue doing what they're doing because they're doing it right, uh, to to work across the organization and try to find some more synergies related to, to the resiliency of the organization along with the other initiatives that they want to have. And of course, if they um, are looking to uh, mature their resiliency program, uh, they should so reach out for external entities to give them help with that. So thank yeah, you so much yeah. for your time. Thank you, Jason. It's been good talking to you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us. And if you 
Uh, we're interested in what we were doing here. We're going to try to do these uh, quite a bit. So uh, look out for us doing them again. We also have some resources related to this topic and others at insightcdct.com. Thanks, everyone.